Here we have the standard YouTube website you're probably familiar with. Hover over a video, it starts auto playing. You have this really fancy sidebar that has a lot of stuff going on. It's quite complicated. And I'm gonna show you how to rebuild all of this into your own version of YouTube that looks exactly like this. You can see when we hover over a video, it starts playing. We have the same exact fancy sidebar that does all the crazy stuff that you think it needs to do. And all of this is built with TypeScript, React, and Tailwind. I'm gonna show you how to build it from scratch in this video. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. As you can see, I'm gonna show you how to build this entire clone of the YouTube website. It essentially looks exactly the same. Now, the important thing to note though is I'm only going to be building out the homepage. So we're just gonna be doing the homepage in this video and we're not actually gonna be creating a backend that allows us to upload videos and view videos all the data we're gonna be using for like these thumbnails and titles, it's all just going to be inside of a JSON file. And that's because the main purpose of this video is to actually learn how to create this design, how to use certain CSS and React techniques to create the design and to create all the different functionality because a lot of the functionality on this homepage looks simple, but it's actually incredibly complex to implement. Trust me, when we get to this navigation bar, you're gonna realize how much of a pain this nav bar is, even though it looks incredibly simple. So for this, I have a Vite application created, and the only thing I've done is just remove all of the starting code. I just have an H1 that says YouTube. As you can see, this is what it looks like. And I have a logo here that's going to be our own custom YouTube logo, because I don't want to use YouTube's logo and get sued by them for using their assets. So we just created our brand new logo that looks essentially exactly the same. Now, since this project is going to be entirely built around Tailwind, we're going to make sure we set up Tailwind in our project. This is pretty easy to do. We're just gonna to go to the Tailwind docs and go through step-by-step. Step. So first of all, we need to actually create a project, which we've already done. Then we need to install Tailwind. So I'm just gonna copy this command, open up a new terminal, and I'm just gonna paste it in. And this is just going to install all the different Tailwind stuff we need, as well as initialize Tailwind so we have some Tailwind files to work with. Here, I'm gonna copy this into my Tailwind config, which is being created right now by that initialization command. So we're just gonna paste that into there. And then finally, all we need to do is just copy these three lines into our index.css file, which is already imported right into our application. So let me make sure I import that. We have index.css, there we go. So now hopefully if we go back to here and we refresh our page, and we may actually need to restart our server. So let's just do a full restart of our server real quick. And now we'll give our page a refresh. There we go, you can now see that this font is much smaller and that's because the default Tailwind styles have taken over and removed a bunch of the styles that CSS gives you by default in the browser. Now to get started with a project like this, generally what I like to do is I like to look at the thing I'm trying to copy and figure out how it works. So if we look through here, you can see that when I scroll on the page, all of this section on the very top stays where it is. So this entire page header stays there. These categories right here, they stay at the top of my page and this sidebar stays stuck to the left of my page. And if my sidebar is large, you can see I can scroll it independent of the rest of the page. Also on a larger screen size, you can see that this sidebar just stays there. I can collapse it and expand it. But on a smaller screen size, obviously this sidebar doesn't expand. It just becomes this pop out that shows up over top of the content. This is part of why it gets really difficult to create this sidebar. But I like to look at the overall structure of the page. So we have this page header. We have these cards right here for selecting different categories. We have the sidebar and then we have this main content. So we almost have like four distinct different sections. And the important thing to note is three of those sections are stuck in place while all of our other content just fills into this one section. And this is the only thing on the page that actually can scroll and actually just fills in whatever space is left. These other things are kind of stuck in one single place. What I like to do when I look at a structure like this is I like to think about how I'm going to style this out in CSS. Now there's a bunch of different ways to go about doing this, but in my opinion, one of the easiest ways to create this style is going to be making it so that my entire page is 100% of the height of the screen. And then I can just make this one section of the page scrollable and everything else will just stay stuck in place because this is the only thing scrolling instead of the entire page scrolling. You could also use sticky position to put things in places. When I originally did this with sticky position, it made things much more complicated than just making the whole page 100% height and then this section scrolling. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about by going into my app and actually getting started on what this project is going to look like. So inside of our code here, the very first thing I wanna do is I wanna wrap this inside of a div and this is the div that I'm gonna make full screen. So we're gonna say our max height here is going to be the size of the screen. So that's 100 VH. And I'm also going to use Flexbox to lay this out in a column direction. So now if I had two divs inside of here, for example, one, and if I had a column two inside of here, there we go. And we went and looked at our application. You can just see we have these divs stacked on top of each other. Now, if we go back to YouTube and we look, you'll kind of see that this page header actually takes up the full width on the top of the screen. And then below that, we have essentially two columns. We have this left column for our sidebar and this right column for all of this other stuff inside of here. 
we can really see this if we expand all the way, you can see that this page header takes up the full width, sidebars on the left, and then the rest of this content is the middle. So we kind of have those three distinct sections again that we need to work on. So the very first section is going to be our page header, which we can just have right here. So let's just create a component called page header, just like that. And we'll come into here and we'll create that component. And I'm actually gonna put this in a folder called layouts. And that's just because this is kind of like a page layout component. So it's gonna be for like laying out a specific section of the page. You could put it in a components folder too. It really doesn't matter. So we have that page header TSX. Export that function. There we go. And let's just for now return null. And inside of our app, let's import that so we can use it just to get rid of all of our different errors. And now we're rendering that header, but it's rendering out nothing. So we need to focus on what we want to put in that header. So again, when I get to something like this, I like to look at the source material and kind of see what it looks like. I like to move around my screen on different sizes to really see how it interacts. You'll notice this is essentially broken into three distinct sections. The left side has this sidebar button as well as the logo. The middle section has this search bar plus this microphone. And the right section has all of these other different icons. And you can see as I resize my screen, the middle section stays in the center and the other two sections stay on the side. And the spacing between them just kind of changes around as it needs to. And then finally, on really small screen sizes, you can see that it becomes a different layout completely. So we'll need to make sure we take all of that into account when we size this around. But we essentially have a three section layout. And this is a really great option for Flexbox because we can easily space them out from one another. So I'm going to create a single div. And I'm gonna make sure I give it a class here that's just going to be flex to lay those items out. And I know that they have a rather large gap between them, but I know that also as I resize my screen, the gap between these elements becomes larger on large screen sizes and smaller on the small screen sizes. So I'm gonna make sure I take that into account by using a gap of 10 on small screen sizes and on large screen sizes, a gap of 20. So each of my three different sections are gonna be spaced out more on larger screen sizes. And in order to make sure that they're spaced out from each other, I can use the justify between property. And that's just going to put as much space as possible between these elements. And these gaps only come into account when they're squished down to the point where there's no more space to add between them. So now what I can do is I can put some sections inside here. So we have section one, which we're going to put inside of a div. And then we have section two, which is the search bar. And then finally section three. So let's first focus on section number one. So for this section, we need a button as well as the logo. So that's relatively straightforward. And I'm just gonna use Flexbox again to lay these elements out. So we're gonna come in here with a class name. I'm gonna use flex on this. I'm gonna say a gap of four between these different elements. And I'm gonna make sure that they're centered vertically just so they line up really well with each other. Finally, just to make sure that this section doesn't actually shrink at all, I'm gonna set flex shrink to zero just so that my logo or anything doesn't get squished down as the size of the container shrinks down. Now that's really all we need to do right there. So then inside of here, we need to have our button. So we can have a button like this. And then we also need to have a link, which is going to be for our image. So this link is just going to go to the home page. So we'll just do an href like that. And if you were using something like React Router, you would use a React Router link component or like in Next, you would use a Next link. This is mostly just for design purposes. So we're just going to use a normal anchor tag. Then inside of here, we want that image. And the source of this image is going to be for our logo, which comes from this assets folder. So let me just import that up here. We can import our logo from, and this is going to be dot slash, actually dot dot slash, and then assets slash logo. So then inside of here, we can use the logo as our source. Close that off real quick. And let's give it a specific size. We'll say class name here is a height of six. So real quickly, if I give that a save and come over, you can see we have our logo. I'm super zoomed in, which is why it's so blurry. But if I zoom out, you can see it looks pretty good. We obviously need to fix our spacing and stuff, but we have our logo showing up, which is great. Next, we need to create our button. And this button is actually going to have an icon inside of it. You can see it has this menu icon. And I'm going to be using the Lucid React icons. So we can say NPM I Lucid React. And this is a huge library full of a bunch of different icons that we can use. In our case, I want to use the menu icon. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to get that menu icon. I'm going to make sure that gets imported from that Lucid React library. Now, if I come over here, give this a save, you can see that we now have this button with that menu icon. Now, obviously, I want this button to be styled in a specific way, and I'll zoom it in so it's a little easier to see. And to do that, I'm actually going to create a component. So we'll create a components folder, and inside of there, I'll create a button.tsx file. So I'll export that button. There we go. And inside of here, I'll obviously return a button. We'll just close that off for now. 
And in order to style out this button, I'm actually going to be using a specific library. So I'm going to say npm i. This library is called class variance authority, also known as CVA. And I'm also going to use tailwind merge to merge together all my CSS classes to make sure there's no conflicts. So I'll show you what these libraries do in just a second, but essentially I want to have different types of buttons because we look at YouTube, this type of button you'll notice it has no background, but when I hover, it has a background. This button over here has a background and when I hover, it gets darker. This button over here is just like a normal style looking button. These buttons over here also have their own distinct style and same thing here. They all have their own very distinct style. There's like two or three different types of buttons that I want to be able to implement. I'm going to be using this class variance authority library for me to really easily toggle between these different types of buttons. So to do that, all I need to do is come up here. I'm going to create a variable. I'm going to call it my button styles. I'm going to use CVA, which comes from that class variance authority library. Now, the way that this works is it takes two parameters. The first is an array of classes that you add to every single button you create. So in our case, every single button is going to have a hover background, which is going to be a background. And we could come in here and say like gray 200 or something like that. But in my case, I want to actually have specific colors that I have defined. So I can say like background secondary, for example, or background secondary hover. And the way that we can do that is by going into our tailwind config, we need to extend our theme. I want to extend the color theme here. And I want to create my own color called a secondary. And I want to actually base that off of the colors built into tailwind. So we need to come up here and actually do an import. So we'll say that we want to import colors from and we want to get that from tailwind CSS slash colors, that gives me access to all the colors. So now for example, my default secondary color, give me colors dot neutral. And in my case, I'll do neutral 200. Then I can come down, I can do my hover color. So I'll say hover colors, and this one's going to be neutral 300. So it's going to be slightly darker. And the reason that I'm creating these different colors like this is because now I have consistency in my entire application. If I wanted to swap from neutral to like slate, I could do that in one place and it's going to update everywhere in my application, which is really nice. So here for the border, I want to have a neutral 400 as my color. I'm then going to have a text color that we can use here, which is going to be that secondary text that is going to be neutral 500. And then finally, we're going to have a darker version because as you can see, some of these buttons are this darker version of the button. So we need to make sure we have a dark color as well. So that's colors neutral, and we're going to do 800 in this case. And we're also going to give dark a hover. So we'll say dark hover. And in that case, we're going to do just one level darker, which is going to be that 900 color. There we go. That should be all the colors we need based on what YouTube is. As you can see, it's a mostly grayscale application. There's really not much color used. So it's pretty easy for us to implement the exact colors we need. So now we actually have that background secondary hover and I'm getting nice autocomplete on that. Now the other class that I want to apply to every single one of my buttons is going to be a class of transition and I want to transition on the colors. The reason I'm doing that is just to make sure that I have a nice transition between my different colors instead of it being a hard jump. Now the second property to this is an object and this object takes a variance property and this variance property determines what keys you want to be able to set. So in our case, if I wanted to have different sizes of buttons, I could specify a size key. And now what I can do inside of here is I can specify all the different types of sizes that I want. So for example, I can have a default sized button, which is going to have its own classes. And I could have an icon button, which is going to have its own classes. And you'll notice our icon buttons are essentially always square shaped with this perfectly rounded corners to them. And here we have these normal buttons, which are just, you know, more like a normal traditional button. So we kind of have these multiple different types of buttons I want to be able to implement. So we have two different size properties we can use. Then when we call this button styles function, all we'll do is we'll call it and we'll pass it in the things we want. Like for example, we could say size is going to be an icon. And what this is going to return to us is some classes. And those classes are just a string of all the classes. So it combines together all these classes with all the classes in the icon section. So it's a really easy way to make sure we only apply the classes we want. So in our case, for our icon specific button, we want this one to be a circle. So we'll use rounded full to make it into a circle. We'll also hard code the width and the height to be 10. So we'll say width and height is 10. We're gonna say we want this to be a flex. We'll say that we want the items to be in the center. And we'll say we want to justify it in the center. And finally, we'll give it a little bit of padding of 2.5. There we go. This is just going to be making sure we have an icon that's perfectly centered with a little bit of padding around it. We can get rid of this because we don't actually need that code. For our default button, it's going to be relatively simple. We want it to be rounded and we want it to have a little bit less padding at padding of two. 
And this is just me trying to match the YouTube design as closely as possible. Now, finally, I want to have two different variants of a button. So this variance is like the actual thing that you need inside of this class variance library. We can also define our own key. For example, I'm gonna create a key called variant, which is gonna be for the different styles we want. So in our case, we're gonna have a default style and we're also going to have a style that I'm going to call ghost. And this ghost style is for the button that has no background until you hover it. And default is just for a button that looks like a normal gray button with a background behind it. So for our default, we want to give it a background color, which is going to be that secondary color. And for our ghost, it's not going to have any background, so we don't define it a background at all. But when we hover it over, we want the background to be a gray 100. And also, this hover here should probably go inside of the default category, just like that. There we go. That way it's only going to have this specific background when we hover over the default buttons. Now if we give that a save, there should be all the styles we need for this, and we can actually use this inside of our button here. So we can say our class name is going to be equal to calling button styles, and we can pass it in some props. For example, we can pass it in the variant, and we can pass it in the size that we want. And we can take those in here. So we can say variant and size are going to come into our button component, and let's create our button props. To get these button props is actually really easy. So what we can do is we can say type button props is equal, and we can use this fancy little handy function called variant props. Let me make sure I import that. And all this does is it takes the type of our style that we just created, and it's going to give us all the things we need. So if I hover over this, you can see it's going to be a variant that's either default, ghost, or null, and same with our size, default, icon, null, or undefined. So just make sure we conform to the different things that we expect. Also inside of here, I can specify default variants. So here I have my variant set up. I can specify my default variants, which in my case, my variant is going to be called default. And I'm going to have my size, which is also default, just like that. So that's going to be my two defaults that are used whenever I create something. So if I don't pass a variant or a size, it's just going to use the default ones that I've created. Also, my button should probably be able to accept other things like normal button props, for example, children or other props. So I can come in here, I can get all the additional props you would get from a button normally. I'll just pass those in like that. And in order to combine those two different things up here, we can use the handy dandy component props type, pass it in the component we're using, which in our case is a button. And if I make sure to import this, that'll just make sure we can add all of the normal button props to our custom button right here. So if I do all of that, we should at least have the groundwork for creating a button. So if I go back over into here, you'll see we still have nothing really looking that great yet. But if I go into my app and I change out, or I'm sorry, my page header, and I change this out for my custom button, there we go. You'll see everything is still working, but when I save, immediately you'll notice we now get the standard version of our button, which looks relatively good. If I want, I can change the variant to be that ghost variant, and now you can see I get the ghost version. And if I change it once again to have a size of icon, I now get a circle version instead. So as you can see, just by changing around these different things, I can really change exactly what my button looks like. Now, the final thing I want to be able to handle is sometimes I want to pass a custom class name into here. For example, let's just say I wanted to pass a margin of 10. That would add a huge amount of margin, but you'll notice no margin is being added. That's because currently I'm overwriting whatever my class name is in this section. So I should pull out the class name so I don't overwrite it, and I need to combine it with this class name here. Well, the really nice thing about this is we can actually just pass in something called class name like this, and I could set it equal to the class name, and you can see those styles are added. Well, the problem is it's now going to conflict with any Tailwind styles that I already have. So for example, if I tried to add an extra padding inside of here, so I made my padding 10, you'll notice that it technically is applying, but it's kind of overriding some of the other styles that I have inside of there, which is not super ideal, and it may not always override properly. For example, if I try to change my background to red 500, and I click save, you notice that, that did work, but depending on the order of the actual CSS, this may not actually apply. So the thing that we can do to get around that is to use Tailwind Merge. So instead of passing our class name in here, we can call this Tailwind Merge function, which is just TW Merge. Let's make sure that we give that a quick import real quick. There we go. And this takes in this functions for all of our classes. So this is our normal classes right here. And then we're gonna pass in our other class names as the second property, and it's gonna make sure to merge them together so they perfectly work. That way, if we wanted these button styles to apply first, we could pass them in there like that. And that way they're gonna override whatever our class name is right here. In our case though, we want our custom class names to override our button styles, which is what we have right here. 
So now we can remove that class name because we don't actually need anything, but now we can add those in in future scenarios, which is really nice. And that should be everything we really need to have for our custom button. You can see it's relatively simple. We just added all of these different variants up here, which allow us to use it however we want to, whether it's gonna be a ghost button, a normal button, and so on. Now let's go back into our page header and let's actually try to style it a little bit so we have some better spacing, so that we have some spacing on the left, right, top, bottom, and so on. Because right now, if I were to zoom this out, you can see everything's kind of like squished up against the sides. It doesn't look super good. So what we want to do inside of this main div, because this is our first section, this one's done. Inside of our main div, we can add some padding. For example, on the top, we'll add a padding of two. We'll also add some space on the bottom. So we'll do like a margin bottom of six, and let's do a margin on the sides of four. As you can see, that just spaces everything out a little bit better, and it looks relatively good like that. Now, if we look back over at YouTube, you'll notice the next thing is this search bar, and then we have this right-hand section. I'm actually going to do the right-hand section next, because as you can see, it's very similar to the left-hand side section, so it's going to be relatively easy for us to implement. So the very first thing that I want to do is I want to put some buttons inside of here. So we're going to use our custom button component that we've created before. I know the size is going to be an icon button, and the variant here is going to be a ghost variant. So we'll say ghost just like that. And inside of our button, we need our icons. So we have this create video icon, we have this notifications icon, and then we have our actual user information right here for our actual profile. So for the upload icon, I'm just gonna use the icon which is called upload. So we can just import that, there we go. Give that a quick save, pop over here. You can now see we have an upload icon. It looks different than the YouTube one. There's no icon that looks exactly like this in the library we're using. So I'm just using the closest analogous icon. And I've done that in a couple places. So now we're going to copy this over because we essentially want to do this three total times. Because if we look over here, you can see we have three different buttons that we can click on. And so this one right here is going to be the bell icon. So let's import that icon. And then finally here, we have our user icon. So I'm going to import that. Now, if we give that a quick save, we can come over here and you can see that we have these three different icons. They're currently vertically stacked. We need to fix that, but you can see it looks relatively good and they have all the styles that we want, which is great. Now to lay out these things, we're going to use Flexbox, one of my favorite things in the world. So we'll say flex here. We want to make sure it doesn't shrink as well. So we'll say a flex of zero for the shrinking. We're also going to add a gap in here. We'll do medium for the gap is two. So on larger screen sizes, we have a little bit of space between them. But as our screen size shrinks down, you'll notice the space between them goes away just to make it fit a little bit better on smaller screen sizes. So now we come to the fun part, a little bit more difficult part, which is going to be this entire search bar. And it's honestly not too tricky. It looks a lot scarier than it is. As you can see, it really just sizes up and down as our screen size changes. And it's not till we get to a relatively small screen size that it becomes an icon, which when we click on gives us this full screen searching section, which we'll implement also. So inside of here, we're actually going to use a form instead of a div because technically this is a form that we are submitting. So we'll have a form inside of here. And for this form, I again pretty much want to use Flexbox for this. So we'll come in here, we'll give it a class name. In our case, we're going to only focus on the large screen size and then we'll implement the smaller screen size next. So what we'll do is we'll say we want to use flex. We're going to have a gap of four between our items. And that's because there's a pretty large gap between these two different items here. Then the next thing that we're going to want to have inside of here is a flex of grow. That way this section grows to be as large as it can. We're going to justify everything in the center. So we're going to say justify center. And then inside of here for our form, we're going to have two sections. The first section is going to be for our actual input. And the next one is going to be for our button. So we're going to have a div that wraps our input. And then we're going to have our button. And luckily, the button is relatively easy. We know that the size here is going to be an icon button. And it's actually going to be our default style because you can see we want it to have that gray background by default. And inside of here, we're going to use the mic icon. So I'm just going to come in here and I'll put the mic icon and import that. So if we give that a save, come over here, you can at least see we now have the mic icon and it's perfectly centered. Also, to make sure this button doesn't get squished down at all, I'm going to come in here with a class name of flex shrink of zero, just again to make sure it doesn't get squished at all. Also, I'm going to make this a type equal to button just because by default buttons are submit and I don't want this button to actually submit my form. I want the search button here to submit my form instead. So now let's focus on the actual input section. Inside of here, I'm going to again use Flexbox to lay out my two sections because we have an input section and we have this icon on the left right hand side of it. So we're going to use flex. We're going to say that this should grow. So we'll give it the flex grow property. So again, this is the section that's growing, nothing else. And I'm also going to give it a max width. We're going to say 600 pixels is the largest this can be. Because as you can see, if we increase our screen size a bunch, you'll notice that eventually that search bar doesn't keep growing. It eventually gets to its maximum size. So we want to make sure we keep that in our design as well. So inside of here, we're going to have our input. 
Normally I would create a custom component for this, but you'll notice on the homepage, this is the only input. So there's really no point in creating a custom component if it's the only place we're gonna be using it. But again, if you want to, you can. And then we're also gonna create a button and this button is going to be for our search section right here. So this button is going to be like this and we'll use the search icon inside of here. And this button is actually going to have a bunch of custom styles on it because by default, you notice it looks like this and we need to change it to look like this instead. So it needs to be drastically overhauled. Before we get to that though, I wanna focus on the input first. So I'm gonna say that this is going to be a search input. So we'll give it a type of search. A placeholder is going to say search. And then we need to add a bunch of class names to style it exactly like we want. For example, first of all, I want the left-hand side to be rounded in a full pill shape. That'll give us this rounding right here. I also want to make sure we have a border. We're gonna use that secondary border color that we've already created. There we go. And you'll also notice something interesting about this is it actually has a very slight shadow on the top of this. It might be hard for you to see. I'll try to zoom it in as much as I can. Get this a little bit larger. There's a very slight shadow on the top of this text box that we want to make sure we take into account in our design as well. So the easiest way for us to do that is to use the built-in shadow class, and this shadow class can be set to an inner shadow. We can also change the color of this shadow to be our secondary color, so it's a relatively consistent shadow with the rest of the colors we're using. So just by doing that alone, if we look over here, you can see we have our search input, and it's starting to take shape, but our padding's really messed up. So let's go ahead and fix the padding next. We'll come into here, and we'll say we want some padding on the top and bottom of one, and the padding on the left and right is going to be four. Also, I'm gonna use some larger text. So we'll use a text of large. And to make sure this fills the full width, we'll give it a width of full. That makes sure it takes up 100% width. Now you can see this is already looking a lot better. Now, the final thing I wanna do is you'll notice when you click inside of this, it gives you this blue outline. So I want to make sure we replicate that as well. So I'm gonna change our focus state here to a border of blue 500. I'm gonna remove the default outline on it. So now when I click, I can get this blue border instead of the normal default border. Now let's go ahead and focus on our button on the right to make sure that that looks correct as well. So here we're gonna give it some padding on the top and bottom of two and the left and right of four. Already that looks a lot better. Next, we're gonna fix the rounding. So we're gonna say rounded on the right is going to be full. Just like that, you can see that's now fixed the rounding on the right hand side. If we zoom in, you can see it removed the rounding on the left hand side as well. So they're perfectly mirrored up right next to each other. I then want to use the exact same border. So we'll say that we want to have our border be the secondary border just like that and we also need to add the border class to make sure the border applies and then we don't need to worry about having a border on the left so we'll say border left of zero just so we don't have two doubling up borders next to each other lastly i'll make sure this doesn't shrink at all by giving it a flex shrink of zero now if i zoom back to a normal screen size you can see that this button is entirely done and as our page grows you can see that the search bar gets to a certain size and then it stops and it shrinks down as our page gets to a smaller size so that looks really really good Really, the last step we need to do is make sure when we're on a small screen size, we get a better search bar than this because this is literally unusable. So if we look at YouTube, you'll notice when we're on a small screen size, these two icons move over into our right hand section and our entire middle section disappears. So this entire form needs to disappear on small screen sizes. So our flex property, we're only going to have this specified when we're on medium screen sizes. It's going to be a flex property. So now if we give that a save and we also make sure we make it hidden by default on smaller screen sizes, you'll notice on the small screen sizes it disappears and on large screen sizes it pops into place. So we're just hiding and showing it as we need it, which is great. The next thing we need to do is to add these icons on the right hand side when we're on a small screen size. So what I wanna do is I wanna just copy this button. I'm gonna paste it down to create a brand new button. This one is going to be the same variant of ghost. This is gonna be a search button in our case though. And if we give it a quick save, you can see it shows up. But the key is I only want it to show up on small screen sizes. So on medium above, this is going to be hidden. So as you can see, when I increase my screen size, it hides as soon as this search bar shows up. Now I just need to make sure if we go over here, we have an icon as well. If I shrink this down enough for this icon right here for the microphone. So let's come over here and we'll work on that microphone icon next. I'll just copy over essentially this entire button because it's going to be literally identical. It's just going to use the mic instead. Now you can see we have all these icons showing up side by side on the small screen size. Next, we need to work on interaction. Right now we've done a bunch of design, but nothing's been interactive yet. So I wanna make it when I click on this button, I get the exact same thing as what I get in YouTube. So you can see when I click, I get a full screen version of the search bar. And apparently in incognito mode, they give you the most ridiculous default search results. But anyway, continuing onward, we just wanna make sure we have that. And also we have this back button showing up. So we essentially wanna create this full layout as well. So all we need to do for that is create a state variable. We'll come up here, we'll say const, and this is gonna be show full width search and set show full width search. 
Make sure I spell this properly. There we go. That's going to be use state. By default, we're going to set this to false. I'm going to import this so we can have it be usable. And then what we do in our search button, we can just have an on click for this search button where we actually set that property. So we set this to true. So now this variable is going to be true when we click on that button. And all we need to do is make sure that we just show this right here. So whenever this is true, we want to hide this entire right hand side section. So I'm going to use some string interpolation in here so we can use a really quick if check inside of our code. But what I want to do is I want to say, hey, you know what? If that show full width search bar is true, well, I want this to be hidden. Otherwise, I want it to be a display of flex. And we're going to remove this flex property from here. So essentially, we're only showing this section if that button is not clicked. So now when I click on this button, you can see this entire right hand side has disappeared just like I want it to. We'll just refresh that so we get it back to how we had it. And I want to do the exact same thing up here as well. So I'm actually just going to essentially copy this up. So we're going to have inside of here, all of that. Make sure I minimize that down. We'll copy over this exact same code because we're going to be using the same code. Move the flex down into there. Make sure I get the dollar sign. And there we go. So now when I click, you can see both the left and the right hand side have completely disappeared. All we need to do next is make it so that the form in the middle actually shows up. So let's do the exact same thing here. There we go. We're going to have that exact same code. So if the show full width search bar is true, we want this to be a display of flex. Otherwise, we want it to be hidden just like that. Now, if we give that a quick save and we give this a refresh, we should see if we click this, we have our search bar in the middle, but we'll see it's still not showing up. That's just because I need to remove this hidden class here. There we go. Now it's showing up just like we expect. Also, if I increase my screen size, you'll notice it stays as that full width search bar, which is exactly pretty much what we want. If we want to be a little bit more explicit, we can just move this medium of flex into here. That way, it's only going to be flex on the larger screen sizes. Otherwise, it'll be hidden by default if this show full width search bar is not selected. That way, all of our styling for display is in one single place. And the next thing that we need to do, and pretty much the last thing, is just add this back button because otherwise, all of our functionality is still there. So to add the back button, we're just going to do it outside this div. I'm going to copy this button over because it's going to be very similar between all these other buttons. This one is going to be an arrow to the left, and let's just import that. And now if we give it a save, you can see we have that showing up right here. This one, I believe, should be a ghost icon, though. So let's actually change the variant to be ghost. There we go. And then finally, we want to make it so when we click on this, we actually just unset that variable. So we can say set show full search width to false. There we go. So now you can see we have this. We click on it. We go back to our normal view. Click on this. There we go. That's all working just fine. And if we're on a large screen size, we click back. You can see it looks like it's working. Really, this back button just shouldn't be there when we're showing the full width search bar. So let's just shrink this down a little bit. And here, if we are showing our full width search, then show the back button. Otherwise, completely hide it. So now that back button is hidden unless we are in the full screen search mode like this. There we go, that is perking perfectly, and it looks like our entire header is completely done. Now, if we go back to our app, we have our header done, and if we go back to YouTube, you can see inside of this, we essentially have a grid layout now for this next section. As you can see, our grid has two columns. On the left-hand side, we have the sidebar that expands the entire height, and on the right-hand side, we essentially have these categories, as well as this entire main section for all of our videos and pretty much everything else. So I'm actually going to create a div here that is going to be a grid layout and it's going to follow that exact same grid layout that I mentioned of two columns. So we're going to have a grid and it's going to have two columns. So we'll say columns like this. The first column is going to be an auto size and the second one is going to fill all of the remaining space that we have. Then what I want to do is I want to add just a couple other things inside of here to make it work perfectly. First of all, I want this to be a flex grow of one because I want this entire bottom section to grow to fill the entire size of our screen. And then finally, I want to set the overflow here to auto, and that's going to make sure that this section can actually scroll while the rest of our page stays static. So if we give that a quick save, we come over here, you'll notice there's nothing that's really changed yet. But as soon as we start to put a bunch of content inside of this div, it'll give us the ability to do the scrolling like you can see here, where it's just allowing us to scroll these sections independently of the rest of our page and everything else stays stuck just where we want it to be. Now, if we go ahead and look at YouTube, you'll notice that the next things we have are either the sidebar or these categories. I'm actually going to save this sidebar till later because that is the most complicated part by far. So instead, we're going to do these categories. So to make sure our grid works fine, I'm going to put in a div, and this is going to essentially emulate what our sidebar would be. So I just I put the text sidebar inside of here if I really want to for now. And then after that, I'm going to have another div, and that's going to contain these two sections. So we're going to have our categories here, and then we're going to have this grid section down here. 
So for our categories, we want this to be stuck to the top of the page. So what we can do is we can make sure that we give this a class name here of sticky to make sure it sticks. We can give it a top of zero, so it sticks to the top. A background of white, a Z index of 10. That way it makes sure that it's stuck perfectly to the top. And we'll add in some padding on the bottom of four to give it just a little bit of space from this content. You can see it has this little bit of padding on the bottom. So that'll make it look exactly like we want it to. Then what we can do is we can create a component called category hills just like that. Make sure I spell this. There we go, category pills. And that's going to be for this entire section. And let's create that component here. Export that function. There we go. For now, I'll just return null. And inside of here, we'll make sure that we import that so we can use it. There we go. So now we should have no more errors. Everything's working. And if I put some text inside of here, we can see that that text is showing up right there. Now, if we go ahead and look at YouTube, you'll notice that as we shrink down our screen size, you can see that we get these little arrows that show up on the right and the left hand side. This is where almost all of the complicated code for this is going to come. The rest of it is relatively straightforward to implement. So let's go ahead and we're going to create a div that's going to wrap all of this. I'm going to give this a class name of overflow X. That's going to allow us to actually have these things. I'm going to make this overflow hidden. That's going to make it so we can actually have these arrows that toggle us side to side as we do here. And also I'm going to make it so it's position relative. That way we can actually position these arrows on the left and the right overlapping everything absolutely. So that's what those two classes are going to be doing for us. And then I'm going to have a div that's going to wrap all of our different categories. And we're going to use my favorite thing, Flexbox, to do all this. So we're going to come in here with a flex. I want to make sure that there's no wrapping at all going on. So I don't want any wrapping. I'm going to give them a gap of three between them. And also in order to do my transition, I'm actually going to use a, essentially a translate property. So I'm going to do a transition on the transform property here to make it so that when I actually do my sliding, you can see it animates instead of just jumping to the next one. Finally, I'm going to set the width here to max content just to make sure that it fills the maximum space that it possibly can. Now inside of here, we can actually go ahead and create our buttons for our different pills. So for now, I'm just going to hard code one button and then we'll work on creating an array to do all of this. I'm going to use our button class that we've created already. And inside of here, let's just put like the text all, for example. So now if we give that a quick save and we look over here, you can see we have this all button showing up, but it's not styled like we want it to. So we need to add some custom styles to it. So inside of here for our styles, I want to say our padding in the Y direction is one and our padding in the X direction is going to be three. And then finally rounded large. And again, we don't want to have any wrapping. So we're going to say white space is going to be no wrap. Give that a quick save, come over here. And now the pill is looking a little bit better. Let me copy this entire button so that we actually have two buttons. And this second one, we'll just have it say JavaScript. There we go. If we go over here, you can see we have these two buttons side by side. And I want to make it so that this all button is actually a dark button. But we don't really have a variant for that yet. So I'm going to create a variant for dark. There we go. And I'm going to come into my button. Let's create a brand new variant inside of here, which is called dark. And for this variant, we want to have a couple classes. So first of all, I want my background to be secondary dark. I want the background when we hover over it to be that hover background. So we'll say background secondary dark hover. And then finally, I want my text to be a more white color. So we'll use that text secondary class. So now you can see we have this dark button showing up for the dark class and all the other buttons look normal, which is great. So now we can minimize out of that. We can go back over into this pill section here. And instead of hard coding all of these different pills, I actually want to pull them in as a prop. So we'll say that we have like some categories that are coming in. So let's do our category pill props. Copy over that type. There we go. And this is going to be categories, which is a string array. There we go. So now inside of our app, when we call this, we need to pass in our categories just like this. And we'll pass it in as a variable called categories. Now, normally you'd pull this from like some type of API using fetch or using like some kind of backend service. But in our case, we're just going to hard code this as a JSON value, just so we don't have to worry about implementing the full backend. So I'll create a data variable or a data folder here. We'll create a file called home.ts and inside of here, I'm just going to copy this over. This is just going to export a bunch of categories. As you can see, I've just created a bunch of categories for us to use. So now we can actually loop through these categories inside of here. So we'll say map through each category. And for each category, I want to just render out that button. So the button text is going to be this text right here. And I'm going to have a key on here, which is also going to be our category. 
So we'll give that a quick save. I'll remove this button down here, make sure I save my app and import this categories as well. Now you see that our different categories are showing up. Obviously our styles aren't like what we want them to be, but you can see that they are here, which is good. They all are this hard-coded active style though, and we want to make it so that they can be changed between active and not active based on what we click on. So as you can see here, when I click, it changes which one is active. So we wanna make sure we implement that as well. So to do that, we need to pass down the category into here. So we'll say like selected category, and then we also want to have some type of other property that we pass down as well for how we select it. So in our case, that would be an on select property just like that. So here we're going to essentially create a state variable. We'll just say like selected category. And we'll say set selected category. Use state just like that. And we'll just make it so that by default, the very first category is the one that is selected. So now we can pass down the selected category and we can also pass in our on select, which is just setting it like that. There we go. And now if we go into here, we can make sure we take in the selected category and the on select, which up here, our selected category is just a string and on select is just a function that takes in a category, which is a string and it returns void. There we go. So now we can compare down here what our variant is going to be based on if our selected category is equal to our current category. Well, we know that that is the active one. So that is our dark class. Otherwise, it's going to be our default. There we go. So now you can see only the first one is that active class. And now all I need to do is make it when I click on a button, it calls that on select function with the correct category. So we'll say on select with our category. There we go. So now if I click on any of these, you can see it's toggling between them and I'm getting a nice little fade transition for my colors, which is really cool. So now let's go ahead and fix this scrolling problem that we have. We're gonna go back into our app page here to fix that problem. Right now we have this sticky section for our category, but we're actually missing a div that we should wrap this in to give it some spacing as well as to fix the overflow problem. So to fix the overflow, we're just gonna say overflow X is hidden. There we go. Close that off. I want to make sure I put my category pills inside of there. Give that a quick save, and that at least got rid of the scroll bar, which is really great. Also, I'm going to give this some padding on the left and right, as well as on the bottom, just to give it some space from the sidebar. So already, this is looking really good. Next, we just need to add the ability for make us so we can scroll this section instead of just having it hidden by default. So let's go ahead into our category pills section, and we're going to minimize down this section because that's just for rendering out our categories. I'm going to create a new div here, and this div is going to be for rendering the arrow on the left-hand side. So we're going to give it a div. And inside of here, we want to have a chevron left class, or sorry, icon is what we're going to use. Import that. If we give that a save, you can see what that icon looks like right there. And we're going to add a ton of different styles to this div to make it work. And also, I'm going to put this inside of a button. So we'll just say button like this. And we'll put that chevron inside of it and we'll give it all the classes we need for example variant is going to be a ghost button and it's going to be an icon button as well and then finally we need to add a few other custom classes to this i want the height to be 100 percent i want it to be a square aspect ratio and i want the width to be automatic based on what the height is and then finally we'll add a padding of 1.5 the reason I'm doing that is just so it's going to make sure it fits perfectly within the size of these buttons, no matter what size those buttons are. Now we need to position this directly over top of this all button. So that's where we're going to add a bunch of different classes to do. So first of all, absolute, we're going to set the left to zero. We're going to set the top to one half, and we're going to set a negative translate in the Y direction of one half as well. By doing that, we've essentially perfectly centered this inside of there, as you can see. Then what we want to do is we want to add a background gradient. And this background gradient is going to go to the right hand side. It's going to start at white by saying from white. It's going to start at that white color at 50% and then it's going to end at a transparent color all the way on the farthest right hand side. Now the last thing we need to do is just give it a width. So we're going to say width 24 and height full. And as you can see, now we have this nice gradient that is going from the white color to transparent. As you can see, it's kind of fading out. It's a little bit hard to see, but if I made it a little bit whiter, for example, if I made it 48 instead, you can now see this really large white that is fading into a transparent color all the way on the right-hand side. And just by doing from 50%, it just makes it so that the gradient starts farther off the side so it stays white for longer. 
Let's bring this back to 24 so it looks a little better. And that is pretty much what we want our left hand side icon to look like. We only want to show this some of the time. So essentially I want to have some state variables. I want to have an is left visible state variable. That's going to determine if this left clicker button is visible. So set is left visible. And that's gonna be using state. And by default, it'll be false. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing with the right hand side. I'm gonna actually make sure this is up here, like it should be, there we go. And this should say is right visible. There we go, get my capitalization correct. And now we can make sure we only render this entire div if the left hand side should be visible. There we go, so now the button has disappeared. And if I change this to true, you can see it appeared. So now essentially what I wanna do is when I click on one of the buttons left or right, if I just copy this, I can essentially do my right button real quick. So let's just come in here and real quickly do that so we at least have the right button. So is right visible? Let's make it true by default so we can at least see it. You can see right now it's on the left hand side. We'll change this to a chevron right. There we go. We wanna make it so that it's on the right hand side instead. And we just wanna swap around this gradient so that it goes to the left instead of to the right. And then finally, we wanna make sure that our button is showing up all the way on the right hand side. So an easy way to do that is just say flex and justify end, and that'll push this all the way to the right hand side, just like that. So now our right hand button is looking really, really good too. So we can minimize these down for now. Let's make them both not visible by default. And let's figure out how we want to determine if they're visible as well as determine what they do. So essentially when I click on one of these buttons, I want to translate this entire thing by a set number of pixels. You can see every time I click, it moves this by a set number of pixels in whichever direction I click on. So I want to have a set number of pixels. We'll just say like translate amount. Let's just say like 200 pixels by default. That's how far I'm gonna move it. And I wanna move it that much every single time I click on one of these buttons. So let's start with the left-hand side button first because that's the easiest to understand. We'll come in here with an on click. And what we wanna do is we want to set a state variable, which in our case is gonna be a translate variable. So I'm just gonna copy this down. This is gonna say translate, set translate. And by default, we're not gonna have any translate set at all. So we're gonna keep this as zero. So here I want to modify that translate by calling set translate. I wanna get the current translate property just like that. And then let's determine what our new translate is going to be. So our new translate is just taking our current translate minus the translate amount. So if we're translated at 300 pixels, minus 200 will put us down to 100 pixels. But I first wanna check if we've gone too far, because if this value is less than zero, that means we're trying to move too far, so we should just clamp it at zero. So if our new translate is less than or equal to zero, just make sure we return zero as our new value. Otherwise, return our new translate value. Since it's larger than zero, it means it's a valid value. So this will allow us to move to the left 200 pixels at a time. And in order to see what this translate looks like, what we can do is we can just get rid of this real quick, maximize this section, and we just need to add a new style to this div. So we can say we're gonna have a style here, and this style is going to be for a translate property. In our case, we need to be transform, and we want to do the translate in the x direction, and in our case, we're gonna use some string interpolation inside of here to figure exactly what that translate should be. So we're gonna take our translate value, which is just translate, convert that to pixels, and then most importantly, I'm gonna make sure that I come into here and I make this a negative value. So now if I give that a quick save and we set our translate to like 300, you'll notice that this is translated to the left 300 pixels. And if I were to actually show this left button, set this to true, and I click it, you'll see it now moves 200 pixels to the left, and again, it moves 200 pixels to the left, 200 pixels to the left, until eventually, at this point, we're moved all the way to the left. Behind this is just the all button. You can't see it because this is covering it, but we're as far left as we can possibly go, and we would want to hide this icon. And right now, it's just hard-coded, so we can't really deal with that. Let's bring that back to zero, though. Now, our right button is going to be a little bit more complicated, and that's because we need to determine what the size of our overall container is. So I'm actually gonna add a reference to this. I'm gonna call it container ref, just like that. And up here, we'll just say const container ref equals use ref. There we go. Put null inside of here. We're going to make this an HTML div element since that's what it is. And I want to make sure I spell const correctly. So now we have our container ref. And for our right hand button on our on click, we need to do a very similar thing to what we did inside of our left button. I'll actually just copy it because we have essentially the same exact formula we want to use, but it's just going to be a different way of doing it. So first of all, we're gonna get our new translate, which is just great. 
But before we do that, we should put a check inside of here to make sure our container ref exists. So we'll just say if it's equal to null, return. And that's because we're going to be using this container ref to determine the overall size to determine how far we have before we need to stop translating. Essentially, what I need to figure out is when is this cutoff point going to be reached? Well, the way that things work inside of JavaScript is we have a client width and a scroll width. So let me just real quickly show you what I'm talking about. The edge is going to be the scroll width. So if we take our container ref, container ref dot current dot scroll width, that's going to tell me how wide this thing is as if it was scrolled all the way. So this is telling me how wide it is from the left-hand side all the way to the right-hand side as if I had scrolled all the way. So it's the entire full scrollable width. While if I want to get just the visible width, that's going to be my container ref dot current dot client width. That's just the amount of width showing on the screen. So from the edge of this all to the right-hand side of this eye on this function word, that's what this width is. So I want to determine do I have room to scroll? So if my new translate plus the current width that I have shown on the screen is greater than or equal to the total amount of space possible, this edge, well, that means that I've gone too far across the screen. I've overshot my end. So instead, I should return a new value here. And this new value that I'm returning is just my edge minus my width. That's what my translate should be. And that's going to make sure I'm always on the very edge of the container. So now if I make it so that this is actually visible and I click this button, you notice it's not working because I need to make sure that this right here is a plus instead of a minus. There we go. Now, if I go over here and click this, I think part of the problem is inside of here where I'm doing my return, this should just return the current translate instead. Also, I noticed part of my problem is I'm not actually calling set translate anywhere inside of here. So this should call set translate and get my current translate and then do all of this code inside of there. That should at least fix all of my problems. So now if I click right, you notice it looks like it's still not working. Let's just add a simple console log in here. So we'll console log our container ref as well as our translate just to see what this looks like. So we'll inspect our page, go over to our console. We can just ignore these errors for now. We'll click next. And you'll notice that every single time we do have an element, but our translate is always zero. That's not ideal. So it should be adding 200 to that and returning that as our new value. This makes me think there's something wrong with our edge and our width variables. So let's check what those are. We'll say edge and width. Now we can give this a quick inspect, go over to our console, clear this out, click next. You notice that they're both set to the exact same value. Now, if we scroll up, I believe the problem is, is because we set our ref on the wrong element. Our ref should be set here. And that's because this element has a specific width. This is the thing that is scrolling. As you can see, it's what has the overflow hidden on it. This is the thing that has that specific size. While this div down here is not actually limited in its size, it can be as large as it wants. This should actually fix the problem just by moving that. As you can see, when we click, it is now fixed. And when we get to the end, you can see it stops letting us go to the side. So now we just need to determine when do we show these different icons. This may sound really tricky, but it's actually just going to be one single use effect that is doing one single resize observer. And we want to modify this resize observer anytime our categories change and anytime our translate property changes. Because anytime we change either of those, we want to determine if we need to show those icons again. So inside of here, first of all, if our container is null, we want to obviously return. So we'll say if it's equal to null, do a quick return right now. Then we'll do a new observer. And this is going to be a new resize observer specifically. And for now, we're going to skip what's inside of here. And we're just going to say that our observer is going to observe our container ref dot current. There we go. And when we return down here, I want to unobserve. So we're going to say observer dot disconnect just like that. So it's going to stop our observer completely. So now I'm pretty much saying whenever the size of this container changes, run this code. And it's also going to run the very first time that we set up this observer as well. So it's going to run on initial load and whenever the size changes. And it's also going to rerun every time our categories or our translate property changes. So it's going to rerun every time we click one of the buttons, ideally. Inside of here, what I want to do is I want to get my container, which is going to be my container ref dot current. If that is equal to null, then what I want to do is return. And we could also get this from the entries. For example, I could just say entries of zero dot target. That's also going to get the same thing. So we'll just do it like this. That's fine. Then I want to do set is left visible. Well, the left is going to be visible anytime our translate is greater than zero. That's a really easy one. The more complicated one is if our right is going to be visible. Well, this is only going to be visible if our translate plus our container dot client width is less than our container dot scroll width. And this is essentially the exact same code that we wrote down here. It's just written in a slightly different way. Let's get rid of that console log as well. 
So now we're only showing our right if we have space to move to the right. So now if I give this a save, you'll notice our right button is there. When I click it, you can see our left button shows up. Click back, you can see it disappears. If I go all the way to the end, you can see that the right button disappears. All the way to the left, the left button disappears. So all of that code is working just like we expect it to. Now the next thing I wanna move on to is going to be the video section, this entire section right here. And that may look like by far the most complicated part, but this is actually by far the easiest part of the entire project. So let's minimize down that category section. We don't really need that anymore. We're gonna create a new div, and this is again going to be a grid because this is a very simple grid layout that we have here. So we're gonna have a grid with a gap of four inside of it, and we're gonna do some grid columns, and I'm gonna be using an auto repeating setup here. So I'm gonna say repeat. I want this to be auto fill, and it's going to be min max. So the minimum size these could ever be is 300 pixels, and the maximum size is one FR. What this code is saying is essentially make sure that my items are never less than 300 pixels wide. And if it gets to the point where you can add more items on the row, add more. So as you can see, when I resize my page, as soon as I get to the point where I can add more items, it's adding more and it's constantly doing that and it's shrinking them down as I go. That's what that one single line of code is doing. CSS grid is amazing. And if you're not used to it, I have a full video. I'll link it in the cards and description for you. So now inside of this grid, we want to render out essentially a bunch of video items. We'll call them video grid items, just like this. And we'll just pass in a bunch of props for our video. But for now, we'll just hard code everything and we'll create this component. So we'll come in here, video grid item dot TSX. So let's create an export function video grid item, just like that. And if we look over at YouTube, we can kind of see exactly what all the different items inside of here should be. And we'll create a type for the props of this video grid item props. So the very first thing we're going to need to do is have an ID of the video so we can link to it somewhere else. That's going to be a string. We're then going to have a title of the video. We're going to need the channel, and this is actually going to be a little bit of multiple information. The channel is going to have an ID, which is a string, again, for linking purposes. It's going to have a name, which is a string, and it's going to have a profile URL, which is going to be a string. Then we're going to need to determine the number of views of the video. We're going to need to determine when it was posted at. So that's going to be our date here. The duration in seconds, we'll make that a number. We're gonna need the thumbnail URL, which is a string. And then we also need the video URL, which is a string. And that's because when you hover a video, it starts auto playing. So we need to make sure we have that as well. So in here, we need to make sure we include all those things from our video grid item props. So we have our ID, our title, our channel, our views, our posted at duration, thumbnail URL, and our video URL. We can use all of that information when we create the stuff inside of here. So let's go ahead and we'll create a single div this is a div that is going to have essentially a flex layout. So we'll say class name is going to be flex. We use a column based layout with a gap of two. And that's because this is going to be our image at the top and this entire bottom section. That's our two elements inside this flex container. So we're going to use an anchor tag, which is be our link for the video. So we can come in here and we can say that this is going to go to the slash watch page with a video ID equal to our ID. That's just the URLs that Google uses. And we'll add a class name. We'll make this relative so we can do some automatic positioning of things like the duration inside the corner as well as the video. And we're also going to set the aspect ratio to video so it gives us the right sizing for this element as well. Then inside of here, we need to put all of our image related code. So let's create an image just like this. The source is going to be that thumbnail URL. And then we're gonna to have to add a bunch of class names. For example, we want this to be a display of block. We want the width and height to be full, so it stretches. We want the object fit to be cover, so we're gonna say object cover. And then that should be all we need to do right away. We also want to have some rounded corners, so let's do rounded XL on here, and we'll close that off. We're gonna add a bunch of other stuff in here in the future for handling like the video playing and stuff like that. But for now, that's all we need for our image. And we can move on to the actual timestamp section next. So let's create a div for that. This is going to have quite a few different styles. First of all, we'll absolutely position it in the bottom right hand corner. We're going to give it a background of this secondary dark. We want it to be that dark color and the text is going to be that lighter secondary color. It's also going to be relatively small and we're going to have a very small amount of 0.5 padding and we'll round the corners as well. Now inside of here, we're going to put the duration, but we're going to need to format this for now. We'll just leave it as is though. So right now we're not passing any of this information in. Like if I import this component, you're gonna notice we still get a bunch of errors. So what I'm gonna do is again, copy over some hard coded data for us to use. That's going to be all of this data that we have here. So if I just go back into that data folder here, this data file, you can see I just have a bunch of data that has all the different URLs and stuff and all the video information for all the different videos we want to render on our screen, just so I don't have to type it out manually, just so you don't have to watch that. Now, if we go back into our app here, we can say that we want to render out all these different videos so we can loop through them. 
by saying videos, which we can get from that import. We want to map through each video. And what I want to do is I just want to pass in the video object. So we'll say key is going to be the ID. And then we just want to pass down everything related to that video into this item. So now if we look over here, you can see immediately all of these different things are showing up. We have the thumbnails showing up. Nothing else is showing up, but we at least have the thumbnail showing up. They have the rounded corners. They have the timestamp in the bottom. It's looking pretty good so far. Now, one problem I noticed is this padding should have a zero in front of it. That way it actually looks correct. There we go. And now we can actually work on formatting this duration if we want. I'm actually going to create a utils folder that's going to have these formatters. So we'll say utils. And inside of here, we'll just have the format duration.ts file export function format duration. Now for formatting and a duration, we need to account for hours, minutes, and seconds. So first of all, I'm going to create a leading zero formatter. We'll say that's a new intl.number format where the locale is undefined and then we're going to make the minimum integer digits be equal to two. That's just so it's always going to have at least two digits. And that way, as you can see here, for example, we have a 0, 054 showing up just fine. And if we had something that has like 12 seconds, or I'm sorry, like nine seconds at the end of it, it'll have that properly here. You can see it's two minutes and zero, zero seconds. So that'll make sure it shows zero, zero instead of just one single zero. So here we want to format a duration that is a number. And we want to get the hours from that as well as the minutes and the seconds. So the hours is relatively easy. We want to get the math floor of the duration divided by 60 twice because we're going to be converting seconds into hours and we want to get the minimum number of hours. So we're essentially rounding down. To get the minutes, we essentially want to do a very similar thing. We're going to take our duration and we're going to subtract the number of hours that we currently have times 60 times 60, just like that. I'm going to make sure that's all inside of its own set of parentheses. So essentially, I'm just subtracting this number from right here. So I'm left over with just the minutes. And then I'm going to take that minutes value and divide it by 60 to get it into a minutes format. So converting seconds into minutes. Finally, to get the remaining seconds is much easier. I can just take my duration here and I can use the modulo operator here and 60. And that's just going to give me the remaining seconds that are left over. Now here, if my hours is greater than zero, I want to render it in one format. Otherwise, I want to render it in a different format. So here I'll render it when there's no hours. So if there's no hours, it's just going to be our minutes followed by our seconds, and we're going to make sure we use that leading zero formatter. So we'll format our seconds like that. And then for the hours, we essentially want to do the exact same thing. But here, we want our minutes to have that leading zero format as well. So I'm going to copy that in just like that. And then we want to make sure we put our hours at the very start. There we go. And let's make sure that we return this just like that. So now, you can see if we go back over into here and we actually use that format duration function right here, we pass in our duration. You can now see that these are formatted as actual minutes, hours, seconds, timestamps, which looks much better. Now, before we move on to making it so when we hover a video, it starts auto playing, I'm gonna focus on the bottom section here. So let's go back over to what this should look like and we'll just minimize this anchor tag section down for now. We'll create a div. Again, I'm gonna be using Flexbox for this with a gap of two. And that's because I'm gonna separate this left-hand side from the right-hand side. And inside of here, if I just make sure I get an actual div element, we can have our anchor tag, which is going to be for our image on the left-hand side. And inside of this, we're gonna put our image just like that. So for our anchor, we're gonna have an href here. And this href is going to go to a specific URL, which is slash at, and then we want to do the channel ID just like that. And that's just because that's the way that YouTube does things. Then we're going to have to do some classes and we'll set the flex shrink here to zero. So again, this doesn't shrink down at all. Now for our image, we want to give it a specific size. We'll do a width and a height of 12 and we'll make it a full circle by saying rounded is full. There we go. So now if we come over to here, you can see that we have our icons, but they don't quite look right. That's just because we need to give them a source. So here our source is our channel.profile URL. Now you can see all the different icons are showing up. The next thing we need to work on is going to be the title, the channel name, as well as the view information at the bottom. So the next thing we need is a div to render all of those. And inside of here, let's do that. So we're going to have an anchor tag, which is going to be an href here. This is going to be for the video title. So for our video title, it's going to be slash watch and it's going to be V is equal to whatever the ID of the video is. Then for the class name, this has a font of bold, and inside of here, we can put the title. Now you can see we have the title showing up in that bold font, 
Let's move on to the channel name, which is next. This is an anchor tag here, and it's essentially the same anchor tag. So I'm just going to copy this just like that. Remove the image because we don't need that. And we can remove this class because we also don't need that. Instead, we want to add our own class name, which is text secondary because we want it to be a lighter text. So we'll use that text secondary text and the text will be small. Finally, let's put the channel name inside of here. So we'll say channel dot name. There we go. Give that a save. Now you can see web dev simplified and so on. And what I should probably do is change the class name here to flex and flex column. So they stack vertically. There we go. Last thing that we need to do is add in the view count as well as the time since the video was published. So we can create a div for that. And the class name for this div is going to be here text of secondary. And we'll use a small text. There we go. And inside of here, I want to have a formatter for our views. We'll just create that up here. We'll say view formatter, because this is actually a really easy formatter to create. That's just because we need the INTL number formatter. And this number formatter is going to be undefined again. And here we're going to have this notation, and this is going to be the compact notation. And this just does all of the hard work for us of converting thousands and millions and so on. So we can say we want to format our views just like that. Now, if we go over here, you can see this says 257,000. This says 223,000. This should also be text like that. So it's a little bit easier to read. So you can see 1.2 million, 112, and so on. It's perfectly rendering out that number. Next, we want to have that dot symbol. I'm actually just going to copy that dot symbol over. That's just because I copied it directly from the YouTube website. So there we go, 223,000 views with the dot symbol. And then finally, we want to use the format time ago function, which we're going to create in just a second, which uses this posted at date. So let's go ahead and create that in our utils folder. We'll say format time ago .ts. And I'm actually just going to copy all of this code over. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I have actually a full blog article explaining exactly what all this code does in super mega depth to understand exactly what's happening. So instead of having you watch me actually type all this out, if you're interested, I'll link the blog article in the description of this video. But now if we just import that function and we give it a quick save, you'll notice when we go back over to here, it says things like one month ago, two months ago, three weeks ago, two days ago. This is using built-in functionality into JavaScript, just the relative time formatter that's built in, as well as a very small amount of custom code. And now with all of this done, we're pretty much left with just the final step of making a video play when we hover over it and doing all of the animations related to that. So let's go back into here and we'll create a state variable to handle this. We'll just say up here at the very top, const is video plane, set is video plane. By default, that use state variable is going to be set to false. We're also going to need a reference to our video. So we'll say video ref is equal to use ref. And this is going to be an HTML video element. And by default, it'll be set to null. So now we're going to use a use effect to handle pretty much all of the plane information for us. So here, whenever our is video plane changes, all we want to do is just toggle that for our video. So if the video ref dot current is equal to null, then don't do anything. Otherwise, if our video is plain, well, we want to take our video ref, we want to take the play value, and we want to just call that function. We also want to reset the time of our very or of our video to the start. So we'll say current time equals zero, just so the video starts over. Because for example, here, if I hover over this video, then I hover off and I re-hover back over, it starts over right at the very beginning again. So this is just consistent with YouTube. Otherwise, if the video is not playing, we'll take our video ref.current and we will pause the video. There we go, just so it doesn't have any playing in the background that it doesn't need. So right now that doesn't really help us. We need to actually set up some event listeners. So when we hover over this, it actually changes our video between playing and not. So on mouse enter, I'm gonna set my is video playing to true. And then on mouse leave, I'm going to set that to false. So set that to false, just like that. So now at least I'm toggling between this. All I need to do is add in the video element and then actually render it. So let's go ahead and add the video element. And we're going to specifically make sure that this shows up over top of everything else. So we're going to give it the ref of video ref, just like that. And we'll close this off. I'm going to make sure that this is muted. I'm going to make sure that it plays in line. That's just make sure it doesn't go full screen on mobile devices and we'll set the source to our video URL. Then finally, the last thing we need to do is add all of our different class names. So we wanna make this a display of block. The height is going to be full height, and we're gonna use that same object cover. 
And we want to absolutely position this with an inset of zero so it covers absolutely the entire section it is inside of. Finally, we're going to add a transition property for opacity because we want this to fade in. If you look here, you can see it has a nice fade effect and we want to make sure we replicate that. And for our specific fade effect, we'll give it a duration here of 200. Now, the last thing I want to do inside of here is just to make sure that we only make it visible if our video is actually playing. So what we'll do inside of here, we'll say is video playing. If the video is playing, our opacity should be set to 100%. So we'll change that here. Otherwise, if it's not playing, our opacity should be zero. So we'll give that a quick save and that'll at least make that work. Next, what we need to do is actually make the rest of this work. But you'll notice when I hover over this, you can see immediately it's already doing it. It just doesn't have any nice animations. It's just instantly changing between the two. So what we need to do is add some animations on this image here. So for our class, we'll come in here. We'll just change this around so we can add some custom styles inside of here based on our is video plane. If the video is playing, we want to have no rounding at all. So we'll say rounded none. Otherwise, we want to use this rounded extra large. So we'll copy that into there. Then what we want to do is we want to add a transition on specifically the border radius property. We want this to be a duration of 200. So now when I hover over this, it's at least going to do that for us. You can see when I unhover, the border is unrounding, but we still have the problem with the opacity not fading in properly for this element here. To fix that, if we look over at YouTube, You'll notice when we hover over a video, it waits until the entire border is done becoming straight before the video actually starts playing. It just gives it time to load. So we can emulate that by adding in a delay. So we can say we want to delay this by 200. So first, the border is going to unround and then the video is going to show up. But you'll notice when I unhover, it still has a 200 millisecond delay. So we only want this delay to be shown when the video is actually playing. That way it only does the delay to play the video and when I unhover it instantly disappears just like it does over on YouTube. So that is that entire functionality built in. So now we finally moved on to the final section which is going to be our sidebar. So instead of just having this hard coded, we're gonna use a sidebar component just like that. And before we do that, I wanna make sure all of our scrolling related stuff is working. So as I scroll, you can see that the only thing moving is this middle section and everything else is stuck in place just like we want it to be. So let's create that sidebar. We'll come into here inside of the layouts folder. We'll create our sidebar.tsx export function sidebar. We'll just return null for now. There we go. And inside of here, we'll import that sidebar. It looks like I used lowercase. There we go. Whoops, not from the icons library, we'll import it from there. There we go. And right now it's just rendering null, so there's nothing over there. So let's get started with our sidebar by first adding in the aside tag. That's what we're going to be using for our sidebar. And for our class names, we want to make this sticky to the top of our page. And we want to make it so that our overflow in the Y direction is set to auto, so it can scroll. And we're also going to add in this tricky scroll bar hidden class here. And that's just because we want to have custom scroll bars on our site. So if I shrink this down a little bit more, You'll notice how we have this really ugly scroll bar, but on YouTube, they have this kind of custom looking scroll bar. And over here, this scroll bar only shows up when you hover over it. That's what this scroll bar hidden class is gonna be. We're gonna implement that ourselves. Then what we need to do is add a little bit of padding. So we'll say padding four, for example. We're gonna flex it in the column direction. And we're also gonna set the property here of flex. And then finally, a little bit of margin on the left-hand side. So we give that a save. We've added a little bit of space inside of here. If I add some text, you can see it showing up here. And this very first aside that I'm going to create is going to be for this smaller version of the sidebar, as you can see here, this shrunk down version. So that means I actually want this to be hidden on large screen sizes. So on large screen sizes, this will be hidden completely. So now if I come over here, as I increase my screen size, it disappears. It's only on the small screen sizes. And inside of here, I want to create a small sidebar item. And this small sidebar item, if I look over at YouTube, essentially has an icon, a URL for when I click on it, and as well as an actual text. So we're going to have an icon, which would be our icon that we want to use. In our case, we're going to use like the home icon. So we're going to import that from the library. We're going to have a title, which is just home. And then finally, a URL, which is just going to be equal to the home page. Now let's create that function, small sidebar item. And that takes in an icon, a title, and a URL. And that's going to be the props for this. And let's create a type for that icon. This is going to be an element type. That's what it is from React, since we're just passing in the name of the element and not the actual component. Our title is a string and our URL is a string. So let's create what this will look like. We'll do a quick return here. We want to do an anchor tag. 
So this will have an href, which goes to our URL. We're going to add a bunch of class names to it to make it look like our actual buttons. For now, I'll just leave that blank. And then finally, in here, we want to render out our icon, which is going to have a specific size. So we'll say class name is equal to a width and a height of six. And then finally, we're going to have a div which contains our text. So we'll say title. And this is going to be a class name, which is going to be text small, since we don't want this to be a very large piece of text. So immediately, if we just look at what this looks like, you can see here we have the home icon and we have the actual home text. It looks relatively okay. What we really want to do, though, is make this look just like our normal buttons, because essentially this is just a button. So to do that, we can actually use the styles from our button component. I can export this and use it anywhere I want with any element, which is great. So now we've exported these button styles. We can go back into our sidebar and we can actually use them for our class name here. So I can say here, I want to use my button styles. And in our case, I want here the variant to be the ghost variant, just like that. Now, if I give that a quick save, you notice that we're at least getting closer to what we want our style to look like. I do want to add some custom classes though, so I'll use Tailwind Merge to add those classes in for me. So we'll merge those together, just like this. I'll add them to the end, and we essentially want to have a bunch of padding on the top and bottom, a very small amount on the left and right. We want this to be flex-based in the column direction, so that everything is going to be centered, and we want to make them a little bit more rounded, and let's say we'll have a gap of one between these items. Now, as you can see, this is looking relatively good. And as we add in the rest of our small icons, this is going to look even better. So to save you the boredom of watching me type out each one of these icons, I've just copied the icons directly from YouTube. All four of these I've copied over. I've gotten the best icons I possibly can. So I'm just gonna import these from the Lucid React icons library. Give that a quick save. And now you can see all four of our icons are showing up right here, which looks really, really good. Now that pretty much takes care of all of these different icons that we need, and they look pretty much identical to what we have over here. The next thing I want to work on is what the large sidebar is going to look like. It's a little bit more complex. We'll come over to here and we'll work on that large sidebar next. And we're actually just going to put this in line because the easiest way to create two things that are very different is just to show one on a small screen size and one on the other screen size. So we're just going to have another aside here, which is going to have specific class names to make it only visible on smaller screen or on larger screen sizes. I'm sorry. So for this one, I'm going to hard code a width so it doesn't get too big. I'm going to make it so that on large screen sizes, this is going to be sticky to the top of the page. I'm going to make it an absolute position otherwise. And the reason for that is because we want to actually show this inside of a pop out like this on smaller screen sizes and on larger screen sizes, we want it to be stuck to the side just like this. So that's part of the trickiness of this sidebar in YouTube. So that's why I have those two different positions. We have a top of zero no matter what. Our overflow in the Y direction is going to be auto. And we're going to have that same exact scroll bar hidden property here as well with some padding on the bottom of four. We're going to make this a flex column layout, a gap of two, a padding on the left and right of two, and then finally a flex for our actual display. Now inside of here, we essentially want to have a bunch of different sections. If we open this up, you can see we have this top section, then this section, then the subscriptions, explore, so on. We have a bunch of different sections essentially we want to use. So I'm going to create a component called large sidebar section. And inside of here, I'm going to have a bunch of large sidebar items. So we're going to have like an item like this. These are the two different things that I want. And a section essentially can have a title and it can have a number of items that are visible. For example, here, you can see after we get to five items, it has a show more button. And here, after I get to like seven or so items, it has a show more button, but this just shows everything. So there's like a dynamic amount of show more. So we need to make sure we have that. And we also have this title we can have in certain places or not. So for our first large sidebar section, you'll notice we show everything and we have no title. So we can just leave this all blank. For our sidebar items, we want the same thing. We want a URL, an icon, and we want some text. Also, we need to determine which one of these is active as well. So in our case, what we can do is we can just copy all of this information. It's going to be exactly the same, paste it into here, and this one is going to be active. So we'll just say is active, just like that. So let's create these different components. We'll come down here, function large sidebar section, and a function for large sidebar item. For the item, we essentially want the same props we had here. So I'm just going to copy those over. And instead of this being small, this will be large. This will say large sidebar item props. The type for that is also going to be pretty much identical to this. The only difference is we now have an is active property. So is active is an optional Boolean. 
We'll put it into here as well, is active, which is default to false. Inside of here, we're just gonna return an anchor tag, which the href is going to be whatever our URL is. And for our class names, we're gonna be using those same button styles. But again, I'm gonna be using Tailwind Merge, so I might as well just put that in there right away. So for our button styles, we want this to be a variant of ghost, just like that. And then for our extra styles, we want the width to be a full width button. We want it to use flex for the display. We're gonna center all of the items and we're gonna put rounding of large on the sides. We're gonna have a large gap of four and then finally a bunch of padding of three around all the different sizes. Let's close this off for now. And now what I wanna do inside of here is I wanna render out my icon class name here is going to be a width and a height of six, just like we've done for pretty much all of our different icons. Close that off. And then finally here, we're gonna have a div that contains our title. We'll give it a class name. We wanna make sure the white space does not wrap. That way, if there's any overflow, it's just going to overflow. And to make sure it's hidden, we're gonna set our overflow to hidden and our text to ellipses. That way it actually shows three dots at the end of it. Then we're gonna render out our title inside of there. So if we come over to here, and we were to expand this a little bit, you'll see we have this section for all of our different information, but nothing's quite rendering out yet. The reason for that is because of a large sidebar section. Right now, it's not rendering anything. If we just rendered out the children directly, so we just said children, just like that, you can now see at least that one thing is showing up right here, but we should probably add our styles for what this should look like. Also, we should make sure we deal with this is active as well. So inside of our styles, let's just come in here. We'll just immediately do some string interpolation. So if we are in the active style, what I want to do is I want to add in some specific styles of font bold. Let's just make sure we uh, use undefined as well if we don't have anything. So there we go, undefined. So we'll do a bold font for this. The background will be a gray 100. Let's probably do neutral. There we go, a neutral 100. The hover will be background secondary, just like that. So now if we give that a save, you can see that it has that slight gray background on the active version. And if it's not active, it won't have that. So if we were to come in here with another large sidebar item that's not active, so I'll just copy this exact one down, you'll notice it looks slightly different than the active one. Now we should deal with our large sidebar section next. We should get the props. So let's just copy this over. Props is equal to, we have our children, which is just a React node. We have our title, which is an optional string. We also have the visible item count, which is an optional number as well of how many different items we should have visible at one time. So let's set this to be equal to those props, just like that. We'll get our title from here, as well as the visible item count, which should default to essentially infinite. So we'll do positive infinity, just like that. Now for rendering this out, we should create a div with all of our different styles that we're gonna need. And inside of here is where we're gonna render out all of our different children. We're only gonna render out the visible ones based on our visible item count. So we can get our visible children, which is equal to just our children. And we want to actually get a specific number of them. But to convert this children to an array, we can get our children array, which is just equal to react.children.toArray. And that'll just convert your children to an array exactly as we want it. Now, the last thing we need to do is since an array can have multiple arrays inside of it, we want to flatten this so it's a one-dimensional array. And we'll just import children directly from React just like that. So now we have our children array. And what we want to do is we want to just get the first so many. So we're going to get the first all the way up to the visible number that we have. Then we can render these inside of here. So for now, if we just place these in there just like this, you can see it's rendering out our two items. If we were to change this section to only have one visible item, you can see now it only renders out one item. So that is working as we expect. The next thing to work on is going to be what our title is going to look like inside of this section. So here we have our div, which has our visible items. We also want to have a title. So if we have a title, we want to render it inside of a div. And we're gonna give it some specific classes, like some margin on the left-hand side, on the top side, we're gonna make the text a little bit larger and we'll add a little bit of margin on the bottom. Then we'll put our title inside of that div. There we go. So now if we were to give this section a title of high, you can see that title shows up and it looks relatively good. Lastly, we just need to be able to deal with expanding. So let's just say that our visible item count is actually equal to one. We want to be able to add an expand and collapse button inside of here. So we're gonna have a variable called show expanded or expand button. 
And if that is true, we're gonna render out our expand collapse button. Now let's just increase the size of this so we can focus a little bit more on our code. So we have our children array, and we also need to have this const is expanded, which is gonna be a state variable. Just like that. Use state by default, that's going to be equal to false. And the way we can determine whether or not we want this to be expanded is with an expand button. Now we also need a variable for if we should show the expanded. So show expanded button, that's this variable right here. And this is just equal to if our children array dot length is greater than the number of visible items that we're showing. So if our visible item count is less than the number of children we have, we should show our expand button. Also, our visible children will depend on if we are expanded or not, because if we're expanded, we should just render the entire children array. Otherwise, we should only render the ones that we want. So let me just actually change this to be right there. There we go. So if we're expanded, we're showing everything. Otherwise, only show the visible ones. So now inside this show expand button, we can render out a button component. We want to have the variant here equal ghost. Let's just close off our button just like that. And we can get rid of these curly brackets that shouldn't have been there. And then what we want to do is we want to add a few other things inside of here. So let's add in a class name. And we technically want this to look just like our large sidebar item. So I can really just copy all of these different styles that we have inside of here, and I can paste them into there directly. So if we give that a save, we expand this a little bit, we don't have any button showing up yet, and that's just because we don't have anything inside of our button right now. So inside of here, we want to render a specific icon. We'll call this our button icon, and that's either going to be a chevron up or a chevron down. So if we're in the expanded state, we want to show the chevron up, which we'll import. Otherwise, we want the chevron down, which is going to be the opposite way that it's pointing. So let's render out that button icon inside of here. And again, let's make it the exact same class of a width of six and a height of six, just like we did for everything else. And then finally, we'll add in a div that's going to have some text. So we'll say if we are in the expanded state, it will say show less. Otherwise, it'll say show more. There we go. Make sure this looks good if we just expand a little bit, get rid of all the extra spacing we have. Code looks relatively good. We should probably make it so that our button toggles this state. So we'll set our expanded by just toggling this variable. There we go. Now if we expand this over, you can see we have this show more and show less, and it's making sure it's based on this visible item count. So if I remove it, you can see that entire expanded section completely goes away. Bring this back to what we had before, so it's a little bit easier to work with. Now for this very first section, we only have one more item we need to add. I'm just going to copy it over for us. Give that a quick save. Make sure that this is our icon. There we go. And you can see we have these two sections just like we have over here. Now we need a divider between these sections. I'm just going to use an HR and that gives us a perfect divider between our sections. And then we can work on another large sidebar section just like this. And we can put all the other icons, for example, this entire section inside of here, as well as this show more, show less button. So I'm just going to get started by copying over these so you don't have to watch me type them all out. I'm just going to make sure that I update this to be the icons that we're using. There we go. Give that a quick save. And if I come over to here and I make sure here, I also import the correct history. I want to get the one directly from the Lucid React library. So let me make sure I do that. That'll fix up this bug. There we go. Now you can see that those icons are showing up as well. And just so you don't have to watch me type them out. The next thing we need is this entire playlist section. As you can see over here, we expand this out. We have a section where it renders out all of our different playlists. So we need to do that as well. So if we come over here, we can essentially just loop through all of our different playlists by saying map for each playlist. And we want to render them out. And again, I'm going to copy over this playlist JSON data. So if we come over here, I'm just going to paste down this file for our sidebar. You can see it contains all of our subscriptions as well as our playlist. And that's because we have a subscription section and a playlist section. So now we can actually use that inside of here. And again, it's just so you don't have to watch me type all that out manually. So we're going to need a large sidebar item. The key is going to be our playlist dot ID. There we go. And here for the title, we're going to have our playlist dot name. And then here we need the actual ID for our playlist to go into the URL. So this is going to be playlist dot ID. Give that a quick save. 
Now you can see those are showing up and we should just use the correct icon here. This icon is called list video. We'll just import that. Now you can see we get this perfect playlist icon showing up. Now the important thing is this section should only show five icons by default, because if we actually collapse this down, you can see it's only showing five different things. So this should say visible item count is five. Now, if we just collapse both these down, so it's a little easier to read, we look over here, you can now see it's only showing five, click show more, it shows the rest, and then we can hide them again. Now let's add in another HR here to divide that up before we go into the subscription section right here. So we need another large sidebar section. This one is going to have a title of subscriptions. And this one is going to be a little bit different because while we can render out one of these items, I'm just going to copy it over. You notice a problem is we don't have an icon. Instead, we have a URL. So let's go down into our item here. And instead of just having an icon, we should have an icon or image URL. So this could be an element type or a string. I'm going to update all the places where I'm referencing this. So inside of here, it needs to be updated. And then here it needs to be updated. And all over this code, we need to update all of those. And in here, we need to update both of these. So by default, all this is still working as before, as you can see, I give this quick refresh and I make sure down here, I change this, you can see it's still working as before. But now we have the option to pass in a string in case we want to render out a URL instead of an actual icon. So here, if the type of that variable is equal to a string, well, then we want to do something different. Otherwise, we're just going to keep rendering what we had before. So in the case of an actual string, we want to render out an image instead. So we'll say here we have an image where the source is that icon or image URL. And the class name here is going to be the same width and height. But this one I want to be rounded full. So it's a complete and full circle. So everything is still working just fine. But now we have the ability to use URLs instead. So up here, Inside this section, we're going to do a simple loop. So we're going to come in here, we're going to get all of our subscriptions, which again come from that JSON data. For each one of our subscriptions, I want to render out one of these items. And the item here is going to have a key, which is going to be equal to my subscription ID. The icon is going to be equal to that image URL. The title here is going to be subscription dot and we're going to use the channel name. And for the URL, this is going to be a at slash at and then whatever the channel ID is. So we'll say ID just like that. There we go. Give that a save. And now you can see all these different subscriptions are rendering. Now we can finish off this final section of all these explore tabs inside of here. As you can see in YouTube, it has this big explore section. It has even more after that, but I'm just going to do this explore section as the last section, just so you don't have to watch me type a bunch of this information large sidebar section, and I'm just going to copy this over. So I can come in here, title is equal to explore. I'm going to paste down this, and I'm just going to get all of our icons imported. So we're going to get like the flame icon, shopping bag icon, this music icon, film icon, radio, this one. And I tried to match these icons as close as I could to the YouTube icons. They're not exactly the same, but I'd say they're about 90% of the way there get these last two imported. There we go. Now if we give it a save, you can see we have all of that showing up. The last thing we had to do is just to make it so that we first of all have a divider between these. There we go, that has the divider. And then lastly, we want to make our scroll bar actually look correct. And this is something we can't use Tailwind for, we need to write our own custom CSS for it. And remember, I have that scroll bar hidden class that we added to these. So modifying scroll bars is kind of a complex topic. I have a full video covering it, I'll link in the cards and description for you. But essentially what we want to do is when we have a hidden scroll bar, we want to change our WebKit scroll bar, whoops, WebKit scroll bar thumb. And we want to make the thumb essentially be transparent. So we can apply the BG transparent class to it from Tailwind. And that'll make it completely transparent. Now to make it so that we actually render out a custom scroll bar, we can apply this to all of our different elements. And we can say we want to use that WebKit scroll bar we want to get the thumb again. And for our thumb, in this case, we want to apply some styles of a background, secondary dark, and a rounded full to round off the tops and the bottoms of that scroll bar. Finally, we need another selector here. And this one is going to be for actually making the scroll bar work. So we'll use WebKit scroll bar here. This one is going to be for like the background of the scroll bar as well as just overwriting everything. I'm going to set the transparent background to this in a width of two. So now, as you can see over here on the right hand side, we have a scroll bar that's showing up right here. 
we have no scroll bar in this hidden one because I made it transparent by default. If I copy this though, and instead I make it so when we hover over this that it shows up with a background secondary border, now you can see when I hover that the scroll bar shows up. And it's actually a different color because in YouTube, they use a different color for both of their different scroll bars. So in my application, I'm also using a different color for both of the different scroll bars. Now this only works inside of Chrome-based browsers. So if you wanna make it work inside of Firefox, you don't have as much control, but we can change the scroll bar width to thin, and that at least will make it thin inside of Firefox and other browsers that support this property. So now we have a lot of the styles done, but our actual sidebar isn't collapsible and doesn't do anything fancy. The only thing it does is it's responsive for the most part, but it looks like we still have a little bit of a bug with our scroll bar. So let's go ahead and try to fix that real quick. Looks like the problem here is that it should only be flex on large screen sizes and on all other screen sizes, it should be hidden. There we go. So now on large screen sizes, if we increase this, you can see it's there and on small ones, it's hidden. So we at least have that portion done, but we need to make it so that we can expand and collapse it, which is the hard part. So I'm going to create a context that lets us handle this. So I'm gonna create a new folder, context. And inside of here, I'm gonna create our sidebar context.tsx. And in here, we'll export a function called sidebar provider, which takes in some children, sidebar provider props. There we go. And let's create a type for that. Provider props. And that is just our children, which is a React node. There we go. Make sure I import that. Now, next, we need to create our context. So we'll say sidebar context is equal to create context, pass it in null as our default context, which is something you should always be doing. And here we're gonna return our sidebar context provider, wrap it, and we're gonna pass in our children. And by default, we'll just give it an empty value as an empty object. There we go. So now we need to create the type for our sidebar context. And I'm just gonna call this sidebar context type, and it could also be null by default. So let's create that type, sidebar context type. And this is just determining everything related to our sidebar. And this is where it gets confusing. So for example, on YouTube, in this scenario, when we're full screen, you can see our sidebar is expanded and now it is collapsed. But when we go down to mobile, our sidebar has its own expand and collapse variable. So on small screens and large screens, the actual expand and collapse is independent from one another. So we need to have both a is large open, which is a Boolean, and we need to have an is small open to determine if it's open on small screens as well. So we can keep those independent from one another. We also need functions for toggling it. So we can have a toggle function here and we should also have a close function so we can close it as well. There we go. That should be all that we need for our sidebar context. Inside of here, we need to pass all that information in. So we're gonna use state for that. So we're gonna have an is large open and set is large open. And that's going to be a use state variable of false. And actually it's gonna be true because by default on YouTube, when you refresh this sidebar is open here is an is small open, set is small open, and this one is obviously going to be false by default. So we can at least pass both of these in to our value, and now all we're missing is our toggle and our close function. So let's create a function called toggle and a function called close. Also, we should probably come in here and we should create a function called is screen small, and this will just allow us to determine if we're on the small screen or not. And that's just window.inner width is less than 1024. It's a relatively easy measurement right there. And this 1024 comes directly from Tailwind. This is that large property. So we'll have the cutoff exactly perfect. So if the is screen small, then what we can do is we can set is small open to the opposite of what it currently is, just like that. Otherwise, if we're on a large screen, we'll set this for the large screen. So we'll set is large open to the opposite of large. There we go. I'm gonna essentially do the exact same thing for close, but instead here, these will both just be set to false. There we go. And now we can pass in the toggle function and the close function. And all this does is when I click toggle, it'll allow me to toggle whichever screen size I'm currently on. So I don't have to worry about making sure I keep track of that anywhere else. It just does it automatically for me. 
Now, pretty much the last thing I want to do inside of here is to create another function, which is a use sidebar function that allows us to actually use this context. We'll call it use sidebar context. Sure, it doesn't really matter. And here, I'm going to get my value, which is equal to use context of my sidebar context. There we go. Make sure I don't import sidebar. We don't actually need that. If the value here is equal to null, then we want to throw an error because we obviously can't use this. Cannot use outside of sidebar provider. It must be inside the provider where you use this. Otherwise, we're going to return our value. So this is just allowing us to use our context other places. So now in our application, we can wrap the entire thing in our sidebar provider, just like this. Move this all the way down to the very bottom. And now inside of our page header, we'll have access to this as well as inside of our sidebar. So let's go into our page header and we can actually use that hook. So we'll say const and we'll use that sidebar context. Now we have access to the ability to toggle this. So we have that toggle function, for example, which is what we want to use inside of this top section on this button. So on click, we want to toggle this open and closed. So this is what we want to be able to do. Now, right now, we don't have any styles set around this, but if we go into our sidebar, we can consume this to use our styles. So we can say here, use sidebar context. And now we can actually get our styles. For example, is the large one open or is the small one open? We have those abilities to use these. So what I want to do with these is determine essentially the position and the actual layout of these elements based on which one's open. So for our smaller sidebar, if we go over to YouTube on the small sidebar section. You'll notice here, this sidebar is shown by default on the small screens and it's shown when the large is not open. So this exact same sidebar is shown on small screen sizes and when we have the large screen size collapsed. So here what we want to do is we're going to add in some custom classes. So we use string interpolation for this. And what I want to do is if my large is open, then I want to make sure that this is not shown at all. So this should be hidden by default on those larger screens. Otherwise, what I want to do is I want to make this shown on the larger screens as well. So wherever I have large hidden, I can remove that completely because now that's taken care of right here. So a little bit more explanation of exactly what this means. Essentially, I'm saying, OK, no matter what's happening, I don't have any display properties shown. As you can see here, there's no display properties. So if my large is open, then this should be hidden, but it should only be hidden on large screen sizes because on small screen sizes, it should always be a display of flex. Otherwise, if my large is closed, then that means I want to actually show this one instead. So it's going to have a display of flex here. Now, if I actually just mess around with this, it won't quite work. I mean, it'll show up as you can see here. But we still have the other sidebar showing up. So clearly that's not super ideal. So let's minimize this sidebar and move on to the other sidebar. And we're going to add some custom classes inside of this one as well. So we're going to come in here, add in some custom classes. And this one is going to be what happens if large is open. So in our case, if large is open, then we want to have this be a display of flex only on the large screen sizes. Otherwise, we want to have a display of hidden because if large is not open, obviously it should be hidden. But if the large is shown, it should be a display of flex. And we can remove this right here. Now, we also want to have specific styles for if the small one is open as well. So if small is open, and I make sure that this is properly inside of my string. There we go. So in the case of small is open, we want to do one thing. Otherwise, we want to do something else. So if the small is not open, we want this to be hidden because that means we're on the small screen size, but we haven't opened up the scroll bar or the sidebar yet. In that case, it's th this is what it should look like. And when I click this button, then it should show up. Now, in our case, when we want this to show up, we want it to be a specific style. In our case, we want it to show up. So we want it to be a flex property here. We also want to make sure that the Z index is very large. So we'll just do like Z index of 999. So it shows up. The background should be white. And it should also fill the full screen size. So we'll say the max screen size here is going to be the max H screen. And that's because we also have this page header at the top that we need to have show up as well. So if we give that a quick save, we can kind of see what we have working. Let's go to the full screen and we collapse. You can see it collapses down to the small one and opens up to the large one. On the small screen size, we have our own independent button here. And right now, it doesn't really do anything when I click on it. That's because I need to remove this hidden style right here. So now when I click on this, you can see it opened up the full screen version off to the side, which is really great. I have no way to close it right now because I don't have that implemented, but you can see that this is looking up. And the only reason it closed is because I clicked on a link. You can see if I click somewhere else, it's not closing. Let's just do a quick refresh. So what I want to do when I open this up is I want to essentially show this entire section of my page header. So in the page header, I'm actually going to take that top section, which is this entire first div right here. 
I'm going to move this into its own component. So we'll say function page header first section. And I'm just going to return this right here. And then we'll make sure up here we render that out. So here we're going to render out that section. And as you can see, I have a few different things. We have this show full width search that we need to worry about. So that's just kind of like a hidden property. So do we want to hide this or not? So if hidden is true, then that's going to be there. So we'll say here, hidden is equal to show full width. There we go. And then what we want to do is we have this toggle inside of here as well. Now this toggle is coming directly from this sidebar context. So we can just paste that down into here. And there we go. It looks like everything is working as we expect. And this button is still toggling between different things. The next thing we need to do is add in our different props. So we can have here our page header first section props. Type is that. Hidden is going to be a Boolean, just like that. There we go. Now it looks like we have maybe some problem with our spacing here. So let me make sure I put this in the correct location. It looks like I put it inside my form instead of outside. There we go. Now it looks like things are working as we expect. This expand collapse is working. And on small screen sizes, this is still working. We just need to now render this page first section up inside of our sidebar. So in our sidebar, inside of this larger section that we have, the very first thing I want to do is render out that page header. We want to make sure we export that so we can actually use it. So export that, there we go. So we can go back into our sidebar, page header first section. And I want to render that out inside of here. And of course, we don't want to have this hidden. So we're going to make that hidden property optional and we'll default it to false. There we go. So now if we open this up, you can see we have that header section up here. We obviously want to add some styles because we don't want it to show up on our large screen sizes, obviously. And on our small screen sizes, we want to get our padding correct. So let's wrap this inside of a div just like that. And we can add some classes inside of here. So first of all, on large screen sizes, I want it to be hidden. That way we don't have that double header problem. I want to add a padding on the top, some padding on the bottom, and some padding in the X direction. And if we give that a quick save and we click on this button, you can see it looks like it's just working perfectly fine. The one problem though, is we want to make sure it's stuck to the top. So we'll say sticky of that, top of zero, and a background of white. Now when we scroll, you can see it stays stuck to the top. On larger screen sizes, you can see that there's no problem at all. It doesn't have any duplication. And on smaller screen sizes, you can see that that is staying expanded just fine. Now we just want to gray out our background and also make it so that when we click on that background, it closes out. So what we can do is right here, we can add in a section. If our small is open, then we want to render out that darker gray background around everything. So here we can render out a giant div and this div can just have an on click on it. That will close out. So we'll call that close function. And then we can add a bunch of class names to make this positioned exactly where we want it. So we can say here, we want it to be a class name. So we'll put that inside of here. There we go. So we want this to be hidden on large screen sizes. It should never show up. Otherwise, we want it to be fixed in place with an inset of zero. So it takes up the entire space. We want a Z index, whoops, a Z of 999, just like that. We want the background to be our dark background color. And we'll give it like an opacity of 50 or so. Now you can see we get that nice darker color. When we click on it, you can see it should be closing out of this, but it doesn't look like it is. Also, we can make this div self-closing just to make it a little bit easier to work with. So we'll come in here, we'll make that div self-closing. As you can see, when we're clicking on this, it doesn't look like it's closing out of this like it should. Most likely, we forgot to import our close. As you can see, that is the case. So here, import that close function. So now when I click, you can see it closes out of that section just like we expect it to. Now, it may look like everything's working, but there's actually one minor problem. For example, let's say that we have our sidebar open right here, and then we go and we minimize our screen. That's working. But let's say we have it open here. Now we maximize our screen, and now we minimize it again, and you can see the sidebar is still open. While on YouTube, if we have this open, and we maximize, and then we minimize, you'll notice it doesn't reopen the sidebar, which is nice. It shouldn't reopen that sidebar. So inside of our context, we can actually deal with this by using essentially a resize event listener. So here, we have a use effect. And inside of this use effect, we want this to only run one single time. And then what we can do is we can create a handler function, just like this. And this is going to be on a window.addEventListener for resize. So every time we resize, we want to call this handler. And in this handler, if our window.inner width is going to be greater than or equal to 1024, or essentially we can just say, are we not on a small screen? So not small screen, 
then we're going to set is small is open to false. So anytime that we go to a large screen, we just want to make sure we close our small modal that is open right here. That's all we're trying to do here. Then we can set up a simple return function, just like that. And that's just going to remove our event listener. There we go. So now we have it open. We expand our screen. And as soon as we get to this point, this code right here ran and it made it set to false. So now when we shrink down our screen, you'll notice it doesn't actually open up the sidebar. So we can start it as open, go full and go small, and it doesn't actually open up, which is really nice. And you notice it saves my preferences based on what screen size I'm on. And that is how you create a complete clone of the YouTube homepage. If you enjoyed this video, definitely let me know and I'll try to create more videos like this, but they're incredibly time consuming. If you wanna see some other large projects I've created, I'll have them linked right over here. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.